we are in the middle of a series called Courageous Faith. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Exodus chapter 2. That's where we're going to spend the rest of the morning together. And I really like the story of Moses. It's one of courage. Uh, Moses himself has encountered various things, uh, various trials, various circumstances, even from the time that he was a baby boy. And we saw that last week, that Pharaoh had sanctioned the death of all of the Hebrew children because he was afraid that the Hebrews were growing too strong and too mighty. And if they were going to band together and come up and take arms against him and Egypt, they would overthrow the Egyptian government and they would take control of the country. But we saw some very special characters from last week. You had the Hebrew midwives. Pharaoh instructed them, in fact, he commanded them to kill all of the male children as soon as they were born. And what did they do? They refused. They did not kill the children. They let them live, and the Hebrews continued to grow strong. And so in a courageous act of faith, they chose to disobey Pharaoh. Why? Because they feared and they honored the Lord. They cared more about what God thought then what about Pharaoh or anybody else in the Egyptian uh, world at that time? And then we took a brief look at Moses' parents, how these two people were commanded. The edict of the land was to throw all the newborn sons into the Nile River. And it probably was actually not only an act of sacrifice, but an act of worship because the Egyptians worshiped the Nile as their own God. And so they were commanded to throw their children into the Nile, all the newborn sons, and they didn't. Instead, they built a small ark, they placed their baby in that basket with pitch, and they sent him through the river. And where does baby Moses, as we know today, end up? Ends up in the presence of Pharaoh's daughter. And so in God's providence, in God's sovereignty, he is working out Moses' life to bring about his ultimate purpose, which is to bring the Messiah into the world for the salvation of the entire world. And so we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 2. I'd like to start things off, first of all, by asking you, before we get into the context of the message, what would you like to be known for? I mean, when you think about the Hebrew wives, right, when they considered the content of their character, they were more concerned what they were known for before God rather than what they were known for before Pharaoh. If you think about Moses' parents, they were more concerned about being known for parents who fought for life rather than being for parents who just blended into society and just accepted the status quo they acted courageously. Well, what about you? What would you want to be known for before God, before your family, before the people in this room, your brothers and sisters, your peers, the people you go to school with, the people you work for? What do you want to be known for? When I first started out in the ministry, I decided I wanted to become a minister. I was 18 years old, senior year of high school, exceedingly arrogant and proud. And it's not saying that I've reached a state of humility, but praise God, I'm not where I was when I first started out. And when I first started out, I really had all of this glorious imagination of what I could be in the ministry. I would go to teen conferences, and I would watch, uh, I would go to revivals and big conferences, and I would see these guys up on stage, and they would preach, and they were so well-respected and loved, and almost you looked up to them as some type of celebrity figure because they were able to declare the message, and everybody respected them and wanted to be them. And so that's what I wanted to be. And I remember sitting my first semester in Bible class, there was another guy there in his 50s, and we were talking about, you know, what we were going to do in ministry, and uh, of course, he was really reserved and very composed, and I was just blabbering on like I usually do, and I was telling him, man, I want to go before conferences, and I want to preach, and I want to do all of these wonderful things, and he said, that's what you want to do, huh? And it wasn't until the end of that ministry at my last church that my mind had completely changed. I didn't want to sit and stand on the conferences. I didn't want to be well-respected. In fact, one of my predecessors, one of my guys that mentored me said, you could be the next Alexander Campbell. If you don't know who Alexander Campbell is, he's basically the main leader of the restoration movement. And I said, I don't want to be. <laughs> I don't want to be that. It's amazing when you go through the hard knocks of life and God has a way of humbling you and putting you in your right mindset, putting you into the right frame of mindset so that he can prepare you for his work. And looking back, have you ever done that? Look back at your younger self and you're just disgusted with how arrogant and proud you were? Well, that's Moses. We're gonna see Moses. He's got courage, but he lacks character. And courage without character leads to careless Christianity. And so we can be as awesome for God as what we wanna be, 
We can be as wonderful and as amazing as what we think we can be, but courage without character is careless Christianity. So let's pick up the story where we left off last week in Exodus chapter 2. It says, verse 10, it says this, speaking of Moses, when the child grew older, she, being Moses' mother, we talked about this last week, she was able to nurse her own son, and Pharaoh's daughter did not know this, and she hired Moses' real mother to, to nurse and raise her own son. It says, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses because she said, I drew him up out of the water. And so here is Moses being raised under the Egyptians, the very same people who are oppressing his people of who he is and where he came from. And what we're going to see throughout this story is Moses is going to display incredible acts of courage, but he's going to lack so much character that it's going to put him into worse trouble than if he were to do nothing at all. You know, when I think about this idea of courage, we should define it a little bit. I think of courage, literally speaking, means to show oneself strong. And we don't think of courage as not being afraid. We think of courage as showing yourself strong in the midst of things that you're afraid of. That you are able, through the intelligence and act of your mind, you're able to overcome the things that you're afraid of and do what is right despite the opposition or the situation. In the wisdom of Solomon, he puts it like this. If anyone loves righteousness, her labors are virtues. So these are virtues. For she teaches self-control and prudence, justice and courage. Courage is a good virtue that we should all strive to have. We should all want to face our opposition and still choose to do what is right despite the people or the things or the circumstances around us. You know, when you look at antiquity, at Plato and who Plato was when he talked about courage, Plato had this idea that courage was confidence. It was hopefulness. It was boldness. Courage was to be revealed in patient endurance, moral steadfastness. You chose to do what was right, what was bold, despite the circumstances. And a way that courage was often used was standing in a court of law and speaking up for yourself and what was right, despite the prosecution of the people around you. Now, when we think of courage today, what do you typically think of? Probably a warrior on the battlefield. Or maybe even somebody on the gridiron of football. Or maybe in the octagon ring. Or somebody that fights physically. But courage isn't just something that is physical. In fact, I would contend courage is the quality of your mind. It's a virtue that you've developed that reveals itself in the content of your character. And what we're going to see in Moses is while he's courageous, he's careless. Look at what happens when we read the book of, of, of Acts and what we find out a little bit more about Moses. Moses was instructed, the Bible says, in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and in his deeds. And so Moses is not only going to be courageous, he's smart. I mean, he is intelligent. If you have ever looked up anything about Egyptian history and the intelligence that they had, you will be blown away at their understanding of geometry, astrology, at their mathematical formulas that they were able to create, their, their skillfulness in um, art. I mean, these people are geniuses. A thousand years before Abraham ever made it to Egypt, so we're talking about thousands of years ago, before the wheel was even created, they were building the pyramids. Think about that for a moment. We're talking about one of these pyramids, 2.5 million stones, 5,000 pounds each, built on a foundation to where it's still there today, to where you couldn't even shove a blade beneath or, or underneath or in the cracks of the stones. I mean, they were able to build these gigantic things in the glory of their God being Pharaoh with mathematical certainty and with artistic precision. It was incredible. And guess what? Moses has it all. He's courageous, he's smart, and if you know anything about biblical history, he's 40 years old, and by any standards of our day, we would consider this guy experienced. I mean, he's in the prime time of his life, 30 to 40 years old, this guy has it all. Look at what happens. It says in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, one day when Moses had grown up, he's 40 years old, he went out to his people and he looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Pretty unjust, wouldn't you say? I mean, how many of us, if we walked out these doors and we saw one person just beating up another person, not one of our people, would we not immediately run to that person's defense? And it says this, he looked this way and he looked that and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian 
and hid him in the sand. Misplaced courage. You know, the New Testament talks about misplaced courage. A lot of people today are, are, are courageous. We see them on TV speaking truth to power. You know, I'm going to tweet and Facebook post and let everybody know how courageous I am and I'm standing up in the midst of this generation. Well, to me, and maybe to you, that's not really too courageous. <laughs> in my opinion, what Moses does really isn't that courageous. You see, he's got the right motivation, but he's got the wrong action. Yes, he does have courage in the sense that he stands up against this Egyptian that is hurting another Hebrew, beating them. But what he does is actually selfish, conceited, like a young, arrogant preacher who wants to utilize his power, his position, and his influence. He takes advantage of an opportunity. I mean, think of it like this. It would be like a pro boxer seeing an amateur on the street and running to their defense and beating them up. That's really not courageous. You're strong. You've got all the tools that it takes to fight somebody. And here is Moses, 40 years old, one of the most intelligent men on the face of this earth, no doubt not only trained here, but trained in his body. And he rushes to the defense of these Hebrew people that are being beat by an Egyptian, and he kills the man. He doesn't just restrain him. He doesn't put him under chains to be ruled by the Egyptian law. In an act of rage and selfishness, he kills him. You know, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, Peter says hell is going to be filled with people who indulge in the lust of defiling passion, and they despise authority. Boldly, willingly, they blaspheme the glorious ones. We, as a Christian, should respect the position, even though we might not respect the man. And there are people who are elected into office in our own country. There are people who have positions in churches. We may not like them. We may not respect who they are. But the Bible calls us to respect people in positions of authority. And so when we watch TV and we comment online and we interact with other people and we're blaspheming and slandering and disrespecting people in positions of authority, we're doing nothing for the message of the gospel. In fact, we are no different than Moses. We may be courageous, but we're lacking Christian character. Courage that lacks character is careless and it's careless Christianity. You know, Moses, I think he was right about the problem. The Egyptians should not have enslaved the Hebrews. The Egyptians should not be beating the Hebrews like this. And Moses, he's got the right uh, idea about the problem, but he went about it through the wrong process. You've ever done something like that? You've got the right idea, you've got the right motivation, but you've gone about it in the wrong way? Marriage is, I mean, this happens all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> Your spouse upset you, and you're in the right to be upset, and you go about it in the wrong way. Maybe you call a name. Maybe you shout and scream and get upset because we're lacking in character. And our motivations may be true. We may be good judge of character of the other person, and they are absolutely in the wrong. But if we go about it in the wrong way, we've become the guilty party. And that's exactly what's happened to Moses. Now, because of Moses' misplaced courage and poor character, he is in a very dangerous situation. In fact, he has not only violated the law of the land, he's killed one of his own being an Egyptian. And he's going to die because of it. Now let me give you a little bit of interesting information. Moses was raised by Pharaoh's daughter, the I. And Moses, his mom, had a brother, the II, who would actually eventually become the Pharaoh of Egypt. Well, he had a son, the III. Well, her brother, Moses' Pharaoh's, you know, mom, ends up passing away, and Moses' mom becomes, his adopted mom, becomes the queen of Egypt. She becomes a pharaoh. I've actually got some pictures that I want to uh, show you up here on the screen. And when you, you look at this, for instance, she's, uh, she's in the gray, and she actually, this is very rare, but in all the other um, statues that she built for herself around Egypt, she would actually give herself a false beard because it would symbolize power and authority. And she reigned on the throne for 20 years. So you've got Tutmos the first, he's the head picture, Tutmos the second, he's the one in the middle, and then uh, you've got Moses' uh, stepmom, or really adopted mom. And this was incredible. Because it really was rare for a woman to reign as Pharaoh in Egypt, but here she was, and she became one of the most magnificent women in all of the Middle East at that time. And for 20 years, her nephew, who viewed her really as a stepmom because his father had passed away, was under her rule and he couldn't stand it. He hated it. He should have been Pharaoh, but yet she had the position. 
Well, when she passed away, guess who Tutmos III decides to take his vengeance out on? Mommy's favorite adopted son, Moses. And Moses is in big time trouble. You know, Moses, despite his poor character, there is something remarkable about Moses. Moses acts out in faith. And this is encouraging to me because even though I was a prideful, arrogant little brat, and maybe there's still some of those traces there even today, God was still at work in my life. And even though we fail and we make mistakes and we fall short and we act sometimes with poor character, it doesn't mean we can't still act in faith. I really love this passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So in other words, he says, look, I don't want my position. I don't want my priority. I don't want all this power if it comes at the cost of being called Pharaoh's daughter's son. I'm Moses. I'm a Hebrew. God is at work in my life. Now, we know the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. How in the world did Moses act out in faith if he was raised under the Egyptian household? Well, here's what I think. Remember, Moses' mother, true mother, raised him and nursed him, and she probably spoke words of truth as he grew into adulthood. And she imparted the faith that she got from her community, who they got from Israel, who Israel got, being Jacob, from Isaac, who Isaac got from Abraham. And so here Moses has the faith of Abraham, faithfulness to God, and by faith, confidence in what he didn't see because of what he heard and what he did see, he wanted to identify himself as a person that belonged to God. Yahweh, the one true Lord. And by faith, he acts out and he's courageous. He's faithful, but he lacks in character. And here's the good news, guys. God uses ordinary people with poor character to do extraordinary things. And Moses is setting the stage for one of the greatest courageous transformations that we we will ever see. And what I hope is that when we look at Moses, we can see ourselves in Moses a little bit. And we'll learn from Moses' experience and we'll apply that to our own life. And so Moses probably got this faith from his, his true mommy who shared with him the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the problem is simply this. Despite sharing this faith with Moses, it's not that Moses is still in Egypt. It's that Egypt is still in Moses. It's not that when we become a Christian, everything just instantly changes. What's the problem? It's not that we're in the world. It's that some of the world is still in us. And God is going to refine and work through our character to bring about his ultimate glory. It's not that Moses is still in Egypt. It's that Egypt is still in Moses. And so Moses acts out in selfishness and pride. Now let me ask you a question. Why is it that God would have used Moses in Egypt after, for 40 years, he delivered him into the desert? Why bring him back? Why not just say, look, Moses, you're in a great position. (laughs) You're one of the most powerful people in the entire known kingdom. You're intelligent. You're at prime time. I mean, wouldn't, isn't that something you would look for? Like, for instance, if you're hiring somebody for a job, wouldn't you look at their experience, their position, where they were at in life, and you're going to use those qualities and those characteristics to put them in the position to be influential and do a good job? I mean, by all means, if Moses were to submit a resume to God, God would say, wow, this is really impressive. I think you're the man for the job. But he doesn't. He lets Moses fail, and he takes him out of Egypt into the wilderness. Why is that? Why is it that God sometimes wants to humble us and refine our character and get us to view ourselves in the proper perspective before he'll use us for his glory? Well, let me ask you another question in order to maybe give you a little hint at the first question. Why, what would happen if some of the most powerful, prosperous, prominent people in the entire world converted to Christianity and changed the the entire world for the gospel? You know what people would say? Wow, look at what power can do. Look at what prosperity can do. Look at what being in a position of influence can do. And so God is working in Moses' life through his imperfections and his failures, allowing him to make his own decisions as he carries out his plan, because ultimately, God is going to get Moses to the point that when he chooses to act for God, people are going to say this, wow, look at what God can do. That's where Moses is, and that's where God wants to get you. He is going to be humbled, 
And God lets us be humbled because God isn't interested in other people getting the respect and the glory. God is interested in him getting the respect and the glory. That when people look at you and the decisions that you make and the life that you live, they say, wow, look at what God can do. Not at what Rick can do. God is on the move in Moses' life. God is on the move in your life. Look at Exodus chapter 2, verse 13. It says this. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? So Egyptian Hebrew, he kills the Egyptian. Now two Hebrews are fighting. And Moses goes to him and says, why are you guys fighting with each other? Don't you know you belong to the same people group? And this man answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Rejecting his authority right off the bat. Here's why. Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? (gasps) I was caught. Fear. He runs. He's scared. And Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard it, he sought to kill Moses. Moses is fearful because he realized he was courageous, but he lacked in character. And look where good courage and poor character got Moses ready to be executed by somebody who didn't like him very much because his adopted mother controlled the throne for 20 years, his rightful position. He went against Pharaoh. He broke Egyptian law, killed an Egyptian by his own hand. Right motivation, wrong action. Right conviction, wrong process. Good courage, bad character. And now he's on the run. Courage without character is careless Christianity. You know, the Apostle Peter made the same mistake when you look in the Gospels. The night that Jesus was arrested, you remember this? The Jewish soldiers came to arrest Jesus. Peter, one of the greatest apostles that we know, one of the most strong men of character. In fact, he told Jesus, he said, Jesus, I'll die with you. And we know that he actually denied Jesus three times. But when they come to arrest Jesus, what did Peter do? He took a sword And he struck one of the soldiers, trying to kill the man, ends up hitting him in the ear and cuts it off. Right motivation. Why would you arrest an innocent man? Poor character. That's where it got Moses. Peter went on to deny Jesus because of his circumstances and situation. Where is our poor character going to take us? Yes, we can be courageous. Yes, we can be intelligent. Yes, we could be a wonderful person by the entire measure of the world. But if we don't refine our character, it gets us into trouble. And so here is Moses. He's going to be on the run. And here's what God does. He's going to ship Moses out for 40 years in postgraduate studies and humility. He's going to have to take Moses all the way down before he's going to bring Moses up with the right character and the right attitude. And for 40 years, guys, Moses is 40 years old. When he kills this Egyptian, for 40 years, he's going to have to spend time in the desert doing jobs that they despise doing in Egypt, being a person that he despised in Egypt, marrying a non-Hebrew. Let's read along together in verse 15. It says, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. Priest of Midian, what's that about? I'll give you some information. And they came and drew water and filled the troughs to the water uh, to water their flock, their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered the flock. Another courageous act by Moses. What he did was right in the sense that he stood up for the Hebrew who was being beaten. He went about it the wrong way. He gets a second opportunity. And you know what I notice with God? God always gives us a, a second chance a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, on and on and on and on again. God just gives us opportunity after opportunity to do what is right because he wants to refine our character. He's more concerned about who you're going to become than who you are. And that's why I love the gospel. It's because God accepts us and loves us as we are, where we are, but he doesn't leave us there. And he's not going to leave Moses where he's at. He's going to refine his character. And so here is Moses getting another opportunity to be courageous. Now, Moses is 40 years old, and this is a group of shepherds who have staffs. And they're not just chump change. But he fights them off on behalf of these seven women, and then he goes on to do the job that seven women came to do. And so he goes the extra mile above and beyond 
what would be considered the right thing, he goes and he does the good thing. And that's what happens when courage meets good character. You're not only focused on doing what is right, you are focused on doing what is good. And that's what Moses is doing. You know, sometimes the most courageous thing you can do is help other people. The world says, focus on yourself. You don't have time for other people. You don't have time to serve at that ministry event. You don't have time to get plugged in. You don't have time to help people out on the side of the road. you got to do what's best for you. After all, who's going to take care of you? That's a prevailing philosophy in our society. And one of the most courageous things you can do is act in the opposite direction in the face of that pressure. Remember, courage isn't just about physical strength. Courage is doing what is right despite the opposition. If there is a worldly philosophy that says take care of you, one of the most courageous things you can do is to help other people. You know why I trust Jesus? It's because he didn't come for gold and silver. He didn't come for the temple. He didn't come for Herod's palace. He came to seek, save, and serve. He loved people. He loved the untouchables. He didn't do things that were in it for him. He didn't get any money out of it. In fact, Jesus' life led to a cross. And if you've never reached the point in your Christianity where you ask the question, where is my Christianity getting me? You might not be living it right. Because Christianity is tough. It's hard. It's difficult. We are called to be courageous for God, to be men and women of courage. But I love Jesus because he helped people. And he never did it with an ulterior motive. Now, do you know why I distrust most politicians? It's because somehow a lot of politicians get elected into office and they're in it for themselves. I mean, how is it? Look, I don't care what political affiliation you have. I'm just speaking truth that I think everybody agrees with. How is it that a politician can get elected to office, make just under $200,000 a year, which is an incredibly great salary, by the way, and yet when they leave all office, they're a multi-millionaire? How is it that politicians, and, and we're talking eight years, we're not talking about 30 years, even though we do have some of those, how is it that people get into politics to serve and yet they're better off than everyone else? I don't understand that. And when you look at the world, when you look at the people around us, everybody typically is in it for them, but that wasn't Jesus. And I typically don't preach on politics, even though we need, as Christians, the Bible talks about politics and we should talk about it, but I think this is just a very clear thing that everybody has this conviction. If our politicians are here to serve us, Who are they help saving? Where's the sacrifice? Who are they seeking out to serve? What what is it costing them? It costs Jesus everything. That's why I love him, and that's that's why I want to follow him. Look, if we're only helping people because of what's in it for us, we've missed it. We as a church are here and called to help people. We're called to love people. And sometimes one of the most courageous things you can do is to help people, but not if it doesn't cost you something. Not if it's only in it for you. If Moses acted courageously and then only sought to get something out of it, that's not courage. That's conceited selfishness. If I'm an 18-year-old boy going into the ministry for power and influence and respect, that's not courage. That's conceited pride. God is calling us to love people and help people. And Moses, in a tremendous act of uh, classic toxic masculinity, he loves these women. That's a, that's a joke. He loves these women, right? I don't, I don't buy into toxic masculinity. Men are called to be courageous men, and love people, and help them, and sacrifice. And it isn't wrong for men who courageously help lead their families, and sacrifice their lives, and society, and do what is good. And so, sorry if you disagree about toxic masculinity, but I think men should be men. I think that's what we're called to be, right? And women should be women. Regardless of that fact, here is Moses in a classic case of toxic masculinity, going above and beyond, loving these women, fighting off their aggressors who are seeking to take advantage of seven women. And then he does their job for them and goes the extra mile. And here's what's cool. In Moses' second chance, he acts from principle rather than prosperity. You see, because here's the real issue. When Moses killed the Egyptian, he was saying, this is what I want. This is what's beneficial to me. And anybody that doesn't agree with my worldview is going to die. That is a philosophy that is invading our society. If you don't agree with my position, I'm going to kill you intellectually. I'm going to cut you off. I don't want to talk with you. I don't want to have discussions. Get out. 
that's got to be rejected. That's got to be avoided. We have lost our ability to, to speak to one another, to engage with each other that we disagree with, to love each other through that process. And so we can't get rid of this idea that we are here to help people. We're here to love people, even though we might disagree with them. But it's not courageous to shout people down and cut them off. That's not courage at all. That's arrogance. And that's pride. And that's what Moses was suffering from. But God is going to send him to the desert to change his perspective. You know, the Bible does call us to help people. I love this proverb in 31.8. It says, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. It is a wise thing to defend those who can't defend themselves, to help those who can't help themselves, to teach those who can't teach themselves. In fact, the New Testament even says this, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And we are in an age of selflessness, of idol worship, where we have this contrast, should I die to myself or should I worship myself? That's really where the tension comes in. And the gospel says, die to yourself. Is that scary? Is that scary to you? Giving up your money, your time, sometimes your mental sanity for the sake of the gospel? It takes courage to follow Jesus. It takes courage to help people because you're dying to yourself. Look at what happens next in verse 18 of Exodus chapter 2. When they came home to their father, Ruel, by the way, his, I don't know why they put Ruel here. It could be his actual other name that's referenced in Scripture is Jethro. Here's what he says. Remember, he's a priest of Midian. He talks to his daughters. How'd you get back so soon? What a typical greeting from a parent, right? Ah, oh, my kids are up from their nap already. Please, I just want some peace. Parents, you ever feel like that? You guys are home too soon. <laughs> There's a really funny Dr. Pepper commercial with college football. They can't believe their, their son is back so early. It's absolutely hilarious. What are you doing back so early? Don't you know that state one? And then mom, she says, let me smell your breath. And he goes, oh. she goes, oh, not a trace of Dr. Pepper. It's great. Hilarious commercial. Go watch it on YouTube. But seriously, dad's like, Look, guys, I was expecting you to be gone all day, and you're back a little too soon, all right? Me and mom, we're going to have a worship hour, and you guys have interrupted that. <laughs> One of the funniest stories I've ever heard. It was actually my, uh, my uncle. He's a preacher, too. And uh, he was talking about sex, and I know, let's make it really awkward this morning. But anyways, that sex is a good thing that we use to glorify God. God created us for sex. He wants us to enjoy it. And he called it a worship service. Absolutely Hilarious. And so when we went back to Ohio, we stayed at my grandparents' house. My grandfather is rotten to the core, okay? I think that's where my son actually gets it from. And so Angel and I, we go into the bathroom to take a shower, and next thing we know, we hear, you guys having a worship service in there? <laughs> I'm like, Grandpa, no, leave us alone. This is weird. I just feel kind of weird talking about it. So anyways... <laughs> The girls come home too soon. Isn't that weird? You're like, I'm never coming back to this church. I can tell you that right now. It says in verse 19 that an Egyptian, we got to speed things up. An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And so he looks like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. I mean, Moses is an Egyptian by all standards of, of the word. And he said to his daughters, then where is he? For crying out loud, I get the opportunity to get rid of one of you all, and you don't take advantage of that. <laughs> That's how I kind of interpret it. That's mean, though, isn't it? That's not what he means. Look, it means hospitality. They were so concerned with being hospitable. It's not just about shipping one of his daughters out. It's about inviting people in. That was the basic thing that you were to do. And so he's like, where is this guy? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. He can have fellowship with us. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah, and she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And this is an expression of sadness, right? Humility. Man, I've, I've lost a lot, but I'm content with where God has placed me. And so at this point, Moses is in a waiting period. Doesn't really know it, but he's waiting on the Lord and he's content as he does. You know what? Some of, sometimes one of the most courageous things you can do is wait. It's to wait on God. 
It's not rush into a situation, rush into a relationship, rush into a job, rush into a business deal, rush into a poor act of character in killing an Egyptian, making a mistake. One of the most courageous things you can do is just wait. Wait on people to come back. Wait on people to give you an opportunity. Just wait for a moment. Moses is going to wait 40 years. And throughout this 40 years, God has worked. This is so cool. This is one of my favorite parts of the story. Midian came from Ishmael, whose mother was Hagar, who was married to Abraham. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn child. And in the providence of God, Midian gives birth to this nation, this place, the Midianites. They are people who worship Yahweh, among other gods, because this is ancient times. But here, Jethro... Ruel is a priest. Now, isn't it amazing that God lets Moses go into the wilderness and pairs him up with a priest who worships the one true God? You see, God is not just interested in getting Moses out of Egypt. He wants to get Egypt out of Moses, and he's going to put him in a land where he will be a shepherd, which was a job the Egyptians despised, and he gets a great father-in-law, a priest of God, to reform and teach and shape his character. God is at work in Moses' life. And look, guys, if you're waiting on God, he is at work. He has not abandoned you. He has not forsaken you. God is on the move. Just wait. Take courage. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait for the Lord and be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Well, Moses is not only getting schooled, on the inside with his character, but he becomes a master of the terrain. He knows every nook, every cranny, every path, every turn. And God is going to send Moses back to Egypt to bring the people out of Egypt. And so God is giving Moses postgraduate studies in humility, but also in experience to bring about his plan to ultimately work his will. Let me ask you a question. Would you be willing to accept that God might be letting you stay in the desert waiting for you to gain experience and insight and wisdom in this terrain we call life before he sets you loose? Would you be willing to believe that God wants you to refine your character in your marriage before he sets things free? Would you be willing to believe that God wants you to raise a good family, to show what it's like to love your spouse, to show what it's like to be a hard worker before he promotes you? or before he blesses you in some way, shape, or form? Are you willing to believe that God is at work in the midst of your waiting period? One of the most courageous things you can do is wait. And we'll end with Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. It says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died. So Moses' cousin passed away, Tutmos III. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. They're praying, God, help us. Help us. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. Their prayers. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel. And God knew. The Lord knows what you're going through. He knows where you're at. He knows who you are. He did not give up on Moses. He loved him where he was at. But he didn't leave him where he was at, and he's not going to give up on you. He loves you for who you are and where you are, but he doesn't want to leave you there. And one of the most courageous things that you can do is to pray. Is to pray. You see, for me, when I sin and I mess up, I think, how is it possible that God could love a person like me? An 18-year-old brat, a man today preaching, when I make mistakes and I sin, which I do, I wonder, how could God possibly love me? But then there's also this, how can I possibly have the audacity to pray to God after messing up like I've done? Have you ever felt like that? That thought ever run through your mind? What well, takes courage? In the midst of our opposition, in the midst of our own self-doubt, in the midst of seeing our own failures, to go to the Lord. But guess what? That's what he wants. God wants to hear from you. In fact, he sent Jesus to the cross so that you could approach him not with just fear and trembling, but with boldness and courage. 
Hebrews 4, 16 says this, Let us then with confidence, with courage, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Don't be afraid to pray in the midst of your sin. Remember the cross that can make you courageous to pray to God despite your sin. God is on the move. He is at work, and he loves you. Let's stand and let's pray.